Hello, I'd like to welcome everybody to the CCWSA podcast. I am Rob High, uh, joined by my co-host, Phil Naiman. Phil, you back in California again? I am. Traveling around. We're back from Wyoming and uh, in California for the duration. Good to see you, buddy. Good. Glad you're glad you could make it. Uh, we've got a very special guest today, um, Mike Oxnard. Uh, Mike goes by Ox. Um, he has been a competitive shooter. He's a trainer. He has done some research on lots of things. Uh, and I really kind of want to get into the nuts and bolts of the things that, that he's kind of put a life's work into from, from what I'm looking at. Um, it's not over yet. No, absolutely not. No. Uh, not quite dead yet. Yeah. <laughs> Help me out a little, will you? <laughs> but it's one of those things when, you know, Phil and I have, have brought up on several different shows uh, things about uh, training reps that I can get without actually spending money. And, and a lot of that is, is uh, mentally and how I address things like that. And the way I had initially come into understanding some of this was as a high school wrestling coach back in the late 80s and mental imaging and mental preparation. And I used to call it the psychology of sport, but it's really way more in depth than that. There's so many more levels to it. And as research and medical people continue to make all these advances, um, we're learning so many things about the human brain and the fact that we can actually rewire this thing and and basically uh kind of rework neuro pathways and get get a jump on things that mentally we can be on top of without having to have the physical reps in as well um how'd you get started down this path mike it uh, there were several things that led into it but one of the the biggest things was uh, i've had a lot of fun and i've done a lot of stupid things and in the process got several concussions and they started catching up with me and my eyes weren't tracking correctly i had vertigo almost every night i uh, my hand eye coordination was off my um uh, i didn't sleep well and i got angry really quick and kind of like you were running for senator in pennsylvania yeah <laughs> there were some definite similarities um, <laughs> and so i had to decide is this my new normal or is there something i can do and i got hooked up with some uh, awesome neurological trainers down in phoenix through an uh, organization called z health and they work well they work both ends of the spectrum they've got trainers that work with um with people in long-term care facilities uh helping them get their their balance back so that they don't fall and break their hip and and basically what happens next is people die a lot of times when they're in uh, long-term care and assisted living in nursing homes and then on the other end they're working with uh world champion sports teams and world champion athletes and uh, helping them eat the most out of their body using neurology and so i uh i very very quickly got my my function back my my eyes started working together pain went away uh, i was able to balance again didn't get vertigo every night and started using some of these drills with shooters and seeing just remarkable change in minutes and sometimes seconds. And so that really caused me to, to dive into it. And that's what I've been doing for the last eight years is really uh, going down the rabbit trail of performance neurology and figuring out how can we apply this to firearms training? How can we apply it to something where we want to perform a skill in under life or death stress and do it at a high level? And that that's, that's something we can't, 
we we've not previously been able to to replicate. We can't we can't put you on the line and have rounds coming at you. Um, but at, as a law enforcement firearms instructor, you know, for years and years, I always I always talked about the the most important timed event you're ever going to be in is a gunfight. Um, and so we we make artificial stressors and you know we're trying to trying to speed up and, and race through a course or, or force mandatory magazine changes and malfunctions and things like that to where that performance under stress gets refined under that pressure. Um, but this is this is actually going a whole whole deeper step than that. Um, the neurological, programming that goes on with this is is the thing that that really catches my attention the most right now so um did did you have you were talking about having were those just sports related con concussions um because i i was allowed to be a boy to the bone um you know we we did stuff and and whether it was playing football or martial arts or wrestling or, or fighting in the front yard or whatever it was we were doing, we did the same thing. We got banged up and dinged up and, and got dirty and did those things. But yeah, I've, I've been concussed. I've been knocked out. I've had those brain injuries as well. Um, what, what were the, the, the initial pathways that, that you started getting directed when you were uh, talking with these uh, neurologists and things. So the the first thing that I wanted to do was to be able to do push-ups again because I had uh, chronic pain on one side of my body. And so it would it would move from my left ankle to my left knee to my left hip to left lower back to shoulder, elbow, and wrist. But it was always on the left-hand side. And what I found out was uh, signals cross over uh, between the, the left side of the brain, right side of the body, right side of the brain, left side of the body, between the pons and the medulla and the brainstem. And if that area is not working correctly, then a lot of times the brain will create pain to get you to stop moving. Mm -hmm. And that's what mine had done. That part of my brain was... Uh, underperforming or underactivated. And so we did drills to specifically target my midbrain and my pawns. And within minutes, I went from not being able to do any push ups to being able to do 20 without pain. And uh, all it was, there wasn't an injury. It was just my brain. It was so uncomfortable with the the conflict between what my eyes were saying and what my inner ear was saying and what I was actually touching when I would reach out and grab something that it was trying to stop movement however it could and once once we got things working correctly then all of a sudden the the brain wasn't it, it didn't feel threatened anymore and I was able to do push-ups so kind of take us through and 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 bring us on that journey how did how did you start making that reprogramming a lot of it was vision drills and so the uh, the midbrain and the pawns control whether the eyes are going in or going out or up or down and we can activate or send more blood to different parts of the brainstem by where we move our eyes. Mm -hmm. So by moving my eyes in specific ways, I got more blood going to the, in the pawns and all of a sudden function, function came back. In the process, uh, one of the issues was my eyes weren't moving at the same speeds and they weren't pointed where I was looking. And by doing these drills, it got them synced up together. And so now not only was my brainstem getting more blood, but my, my eyes weren't sending conflicting messages to my brain. 
And so it, it calmed things down. And in the years since I've used this with hundreds of, of shooters and other, other clients and the, the immediate impact on performance and on pain can be amazing. I've had who were lined up for surgery go from saying they had to drop out of a class to being fine and being able to continue just by doing some silly eye exercises that really shouldn't work, shouldn't do what they do. Uh, you, you can say they're silly and you can say that they shouldn't, but uh, we are more and more seeing uh, absolute mental evidence of what some of this stuff has done or psychological even um, EMD and things like that and the ability yeah. to, to uh, do things. But it all begins with that focus. Uh, eye movement, almost almost a training set with your with your eye and the the way your eyes track and that kind of thing. Um, how how was it explained to you? Was it just something that they were working with and they thought, well, let's try this and see if this kind of gets you lined back out to where you're not getting those pain receptors like like your body was trying to send or. <clears throat> so it. Basically, I've gone through a, a lot of training in the eight years since then. And so now when I'm walking down the street and I see someone, I see how people move, I'm seeing what parts of their brain are working correctly and working incorrectly based on uh, how their arms are swinging, which direction their hands are when they're their body, whether their feet are pointed one way or another or straight ahead what their head is doing when they're moving all of those are basically a go into whether different parts of the brain are performing the way they should be or whether they're underperforming and so with that it's relatively easy to say all right uh this person's got an issue with the the midline of the cerebellum not getting enough blood flow Let's do some things to increase blood flow to the midline of the cerebellum and see if it works. And normally it does. Uh, it's not 100% because neurology is not a 100% thing, but uh, it's, um, we were, uh, we were amazing creations. And the, the intricacy and the way that things are intertwined is absolutely amazing uh, if you just one of the things that i i share with people is when you think about drawing a pistol and moving your arm to get the gun out of the holster and get it in front of you you would think that the first movement would be in the arm or in the shoulder but 80 milliseconds before that the muscles of the opposite hip and thigh activate and 10 to 20 milliseconds before that, the muscles of, of the opposite foot and ankle activate. And the reason is the brain is saying, all right, I've got two legs and I'm balancing on them. And if I move my arm quickly, I'm going to create a balance challenge and fall down if I don't compensate for that movement. So the brain maps out how it's going to compensate for that movement before it allows the movement to start. And then it executes, it flexes muscles in anticipation of the movement so that when you move, you're more stable. And it's just absolutely amazing. But it's done autonomically. I mean, it's not ever anything that you and I have to sit there and, and come up with a mental process to go, okay, I'm going to, before I shift my right hand to my holster, I've got to shift my weight to my left foot. <clears throat> no, you can't. It's the, the speeds involved. Yeah. It, it's actually one of the biggest problems with robotics and trying to make uh, two legged robots is they cannot do the balance equations fast enough. Well, if they do do the balance equations fast enough, the computer has to be larger and the batteries have to be larger and the battery life is uh, shrinks way down. So they get around it by uh, 
by not having two legs for the majority of robots. They have other methods of balance, either three or four or tracks or, or whatever. But the fact that we're able to do it all in real time, continually, without thinking about it in the background is just simply amazing. But those are, uh, those are your 10,000 reps there, Rob, from the time you're six months old, you know, it's, it's just, you're crawling around and jumping around. And like you said, being a full-time boy, that happens. Mm -hmm. Mike, I have a question for you. You're, you're talking about the very fine balance between our outer sensors, our vision, our hearing, our sense of balance and, uh, and your brain health, basically. So what is your opinion on all these people plugging in this electric stimulus with the big VR helmets and uh, and that kind of stuff? You think that has a will create a problem for people? So it has created problems for for people. For it, it depends on what you're doing and how immersive it is. But one of the issues is the the frame rate of the the VR. In a lot of cases, it, it's getting it's getting way, way better, but it's not fast enough to replicate reality. So it, it's very difficult to get the the reps to go from VR to real world. Now, judgment is another thing. Uh, judgment in VR, you can train very, very well, but the, the psychomotor skills are much, much harder to do. And part of the issue with that, uh, it's an issue that happens in VR. It's an issue that happens in uh, riding a stationary bike. And it's an issue that happens with a treadmill. And that is that you aren't getting the sensory input that your body expects. When you're moving forward, your body expects higher air pressure on the front of the body than the back of the body, because uh, you're, you're pushing the body through air and you don't get that on a treadmill. So there's some sensory disconnect that happens. You're also, the, the gait is different because of uh, the, the treadmills doing a lot of the work of, of pulling your feet backwards. And you don't have the balance or the leaning with a, a stationary bike that you do with a real bike when you turn. And so what we end up seeing is a lot of people, if you test range of motion or strength before they get on a treadmill and after they get on the trip off, of, I'm sorry, after they get off of a treadmill, they're actually weaker and have a, a narrower range of motion than before they got on it. The brain doesn't like it. Uh, some people do fine on them, um, especially on exercise bikes. Uh, after four to six weeks, the brain kind of acclimates to it and says, okay, this isn't real. And this is something different than if I was actually on a bike and it will accept it and you won't see that degradation of performance. But for a lot of people, it's, um, it causes a problem. As you started getting into this stuff, was, was it strictly a health related move? Was it, is that what led you in this direction, just physicians going, hey, we think these things will help you with it. How, how did you get your start there? It was, uh, I didn't realize that, uh, I didn't realize how messed up I was at first. And I happened to be down in Phoenix for a, uh, a gun class and stopped in at their, um, at their facility because uh, some friends of mine, common friends had recommended that I go and talk to them and meet them and that we were doing things in some of the same veins. And they just did a quick evaluation, ran me through some stuff and it's like, oh my gosh, I had no idea what was going on. And I had no idea it could be changed so quickly. And so, yeah, it started off, it was, it was health and pain and, uh, basic function, it ended up being performance and uh, a lot more than I ever imagined. Well, that that kind of ties that because I was going to ask and and follow it with how did you how did you make that leap into into shooting and training in in that regard? But you were you were there for training already, and then friends had had recommended 
go go check these guys out. Let them take a look. Let's let. And then were these guys already making uh, making moves into the shooting world as far as the the mentality of of the the sport and that kind of thing? Yeah. So Eric Cobb, who's the the founder of Z Health. He's got a long history with combatives and firearms training. Okay. And uh, that's not his primary thing that he does, but it has been a uh, passion of his for decades. That is, that is really cool. Um, so did you just take things that they were doing or were you implementing things on your own that kind of crossed over into the shooting world? How, it how, was, did, how did that how did that advancement happen with you yeah it it really happened kind of organically and it had to do with the problems that people were facing that who were right in front of me and being frustrated that i didn't have an immediate answer and then going and digging in and figuring out how i could help people with that situation in the future and that just snowballed and snowballed and snowballed What's the most common uh, um, defect, if you will, that you find? The, the most common thing is a, uh, I call it sensory integration. And what it is, is the, the visual system, the inner ear and body awareness all agreeing on what straight ahead is. And most people are not synced up. And one of the drills that I do in real time, whether it's remote or or live, is I have them uh, from their from high compressed ready, come up and extend out with their with their thumb as if it's sights on a gun, and then close their eyes and open their eyes and see if it's lined up. And if it's not, I have them go through a sequence of head movements to calibrate and synchronize their eyes and their inner ear and their their hands and basically body awareness so that they can come up automatically between their dominant eye and the target. And what I've seen in doing this with over, uh, well, well over a thousand shooters live and then um, countless more on um, uh, large remote video presentations is an average of uh, 20% increase in speed and accuracy in two to three minutes. And so it's to put that in perspective, if you look at guys who are out uh, running classes on the road for 20 to 30 weeks a year and ask them what they consider a success to be with a student after a two or three day class, it's 20%. So we're able to get that in two to three minutes and then build on that rather than, so it gives us a better foundation to build on than if our eyes are saying this is straight ahead or inner ears saying that's straight ahead and our uh, hand-eye coordination or body awareness is saying that that's straight ahead. That's amazing. I, absolutely amazing. I mean, like a, it's like a magic bullet. <clears throat> It, it really is. It, it changes. I, it changes what people think is possible, especially people who have been struggling. And when they, they do this in their first fast rep, they come up and the sights are automatically lined up between their dominant eye and the holster. And we haven't even touched technique or grip or anything like that. They're just, I mean, it, it changes their relationship with the gun. Yeah. Are you, are you presently uh, running in, instructor courses and in, or classes that you're you're putting people through for these specific things? The majority of what I do is online. Okay. And then uh, a lot of times it will be combined with live training. But the reason that I do it that way is if I go out, if I fly somewhere and do a two or three day class and then come home, people are going to have good memories of that class. And 
they're going to remember the drills that we did, but they're not going to develop skill in those two or three days. And if on the other hand, I can give them an at home curriculum, follow along videos to do, then they can watch five or 10 minutes at a time, two, three, five days a week. And after a few weeks, they will have learned a tremendous amount and built a tremendous amount of skill. And now when we meet live, uh, number one, they're, they're working from a common foundation. They know the vocabulary that I'm going to use. They know the concepts that I'm going to use. None of the skills that I'm going to be talking about are new and they're able to learn at a much, much faster rate. Is that a prerequisite for your training? It really depends on the, the training. I mean, I, I'll go into organizations and they'll have me do live training and without the, without the priming or the pre-training ahead of time. And, but then I provide video training afterwards. What's your website, Mike? Uh, real world gunfight training is one of the best ones to reach me at. I, my two main ones are real world gunfight training.com and dry fire training cards.com. Yeah. I want to make sure everybody also knows Mike's got a book out there that, um, I'm, I'm second time through, uh, yep. Real world gunfight training. Um, kind of goes into everything we're talking about right here. Um, it's just, it's one of those things that I, I don't think, especially if you're new to this, it's not one of those that it's a one and done thing. This is something you can continue to revisit and pick up extra things each time you get into it. Um, <clears throat> the, the ability to do these things and, and really it's, I think it's like a, a cheat code, really. Um, once, once you've got your, your hand eye and everything dialed in, um, you know, it's like I, I said at the very, very top of this show, um, the most important timed event you're ever going to be involved in is a gunfight. Um, it's, it's the thing that we're, you know, we're training for your absolute worst possible moment. And, you know, we touch over and over and over again that that uh, you you fall to your level of preparation. You're not just going to miraculously right. just because you got a shot of adrenaline, you're going to be at peak performance. That's not the way this works. Um, it's something that there these are these are commitments to developing skill sets, but this one really is like a cheat code it's it's getting you it's moving you further up in the line and, and giving you that chance for for great success so I'd, I'd really recommend um looking into this book um reading through it and and kind of just going back and forth with it um, you know, rob but that's at your level this is a performance enhancer for me I just want the opportunity to take the cork off the end of my fork at dinner. I mean, that's, you know, that coordination <laughs> level that I'm looking for. Um, the, the dry fire cards. Let's talk yes. about that if you can, Mike. Sure. Uh, do you have a question about them or? Yeah, or, to explain yeah. to people how they work. So it's a collection of more than 50 dry fire drills printed on playing cards. And the whole idea behind it was that most people get in a rut of doing the same one or two or three drills when they do dry fire. And the brain doesn't like that. In fact, if the, the brain is not challenged and if you aren't doing new and novel things, the, the cerebellum pretty much shuts down because its whole job is error correction. And if we don't, if we aren't pushing things and creating situations where we make mistakes, cerebellum's not learning. And the cerebellum is one of the biggest players in a chaotic situation and being able to perform at a high level. So I've got 50 different drills from 
basics and fundamentals to advanced skills, uh, shooting on the move skills and low light skills. And it was uh, a joint project that I did with some other instructors. And basically we, um, we were all using dry fire extensively uh, with students. And it was, um, dry fire wasn't as, as popular then as it has become. And it's kind of hard to believe, but it it, uh, it wasn't as as widely used, and so well, the, the cost of ammo just kind of made live fire a little bit a little bit more painful, right? Well, uh, that was part of it, and then another part of it is people realized. I mean, there was myself and and several others who basically were um, banging the gong, saying, "Hey, you know what?" Dry fire is the way that you learn skills. Live fire is the way that you verify and validate what you did in dry fire. And if you go out and do the majority of your reps with live fire, you're going to burn through money. You're going to have fun. Uh, you're probably going to create training scars and uh, flinch being one of the, the big ones. And you're not going to learn as fast because of the way that uh, neurotransmitters and hormones are affected by an explosion 18 inches away from your face. And so if we can do the heavy lifting with dry fire and then confirm what we did in dry fire with live fire, uh, all of a sudden our ability to, to build skill and improve, it just shoots through the roof. I think that it's important because again, dry firing. So you're in your garage. Okay. I'm in my garage and you draw and I have a couple of silhouette targets or whatever deer antlers. And it's like, okay, I'm bored now. Yep. So the 50 cards, different scenarios, right? You're, you're firing, you're changing your mag, whatever. Um, mm -hmm. You know, what, what are a couple sample scenarios that would uh, entice somebody to stay dry firing? Well, one of them, uh, a, um, <clears throat> excuse me, one challenge is in a small area, how do we practice moving and maintaining balance while shooting? And so Larry Yatch, former Team 3 SEAL, one of the drills that he did at his stretch shooting facility with, with students was he would have them run in about a 10 foot diameter circle while keeping the sights aimed at a target sitting on a chair or a bench in the middle. And so it does some tremendous things for the brain and it helps us get used to uh, lining up the sights, running the gun while we're moving, while we're maintaining balance and while we're at off angles. Uh, we've got uh, light based drills in there, uh, recovery from being knocked to the ground. So start on the ground and basically do a Turkish get up mm -hmm. while aiming at a uh, at a target and can you do it or do you need to use both hands at some point and one of the keys with with all of my training is figure this stuff out when there's no consequences to getting it wrong so that when there are consequences you know your performance envelope you know what you can They're do not, and what you can't yeah. do you're not the one paying the consequences right <clears throat> It, they're they're just anytime I can force somebody to get outside their comfort zone and you just like to knock people over and to <laughs> do something and do something practice your get up you just keep pushing them over in the academy I heard the stories come on <laughs> any any time that that you know I, I've got people that still are really pressing going why aren't you carrying appendix all the time. And it's because all of my retention stuff and defense things are built into me carrying it at a three o'clock on my hip. It's what mm -hmm. I did for decades. Um, I also have tried it and rolled with a with a dummy gun with a with a red gun in my belt in a appendix position, and it kills my hips. Um, it's one of those things that you have to make yourself do these things before you're in that position, having to do these things for real. Right. Um, so 
this moving and 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 lining up your sights and and maintaining a sight picture and staying on target and and getting in different body positions um these are things that that i need to have at least walked through before i ever think i'm going to perform in them in in a real life and death situation um and the the greater i can become comfortable in my discomfort the more opportunity i have to be victorious in that battle that's just the way that yeah. it works so <clears throat> yeah i mean you hit it exactly on the head with talking about uh, at least doing it some yeah and a lot of the the drills that i have in in different courses one of the easiest ways to describe them is their exploratory drills. They're looking at real world shootings and saying, okay, what was the balance challenge there that the shooter was having to face while he was uh, avoiding being hit and simultaneously trying to put effective hits on target? And then how can we replicate those safely in training and get used to them so that they're not novel and not new and the first time that we're figuring out how to deal with them again is in a no consequence environment and right. it really doesn't take that many reps yeah. to go from something that you know well to exploring something that's slightly different but if your first rep is when it counts you're going to have a big drop in performance well it's it's like you were you were talking about um, at the very, very top of this, this episode, you know, you're going to draw with your right hand, but that shift to your left and the adjustments in your balance and your weight, um, everything is made prior to that first movement. I mean, you're already making those shifts and it's, and it's truly any kind of manipulation in my spine, anything there causes everything else to work on the machine to stay in in harmony in balance um to stay upright um just just those movements it it even changes my head position as i go to get on my sides uh, it's it's why i like you know, don't just stand behind a barricade, use that barricade, move around it. Yep. Using, going around a, a vehicle, um, learning how to, how to fight mobile and, and use things for, for concealment or real cover if you, if it's available. But once that cover is there, that's not really usually a movable thing for me. So I have to use, use me to be the movable thing now as, as we're adapting to that threat that's in place. So I, I love this stuff. I, I love the fact that, that you're, you're getting in and, and truly you're, you're like, I, I've always, I've always looked at it kind of when we're changing and going from one thing to another is I've used this trail forever. It's all cut in. I've, that's that's the direction I've I've done. It's worn down and it's nice and easy and safe. There's nothing grown over. It's a safe walk from point A to point B. But now I need this new trail over here, and it's not as worn and and easy to to go through as as the one I've used forever. But the more frequently I use that trail, the more worn down and and easy that path becomes mm -hmm. uh, it it's just it's it's the way it works in our training and and we don't look at it like that we look at it at at the mental aspect of it or the physical aspect of it and it's just using that trail over and over again that makes it uh usable without thought you know it's yeah. just something that we do um and you're talking about how rapidly people get in and get in there and, and go from, from, you know, the first contact with the pistol to it's there and it's in front of your eyes and, and you're on target. Um, and it's something that you get there 
you can develop that relatively quickly. Um, same thing we've talked over and over and over again about nothing more than just dry fire, just learning learning the the trigger and, and knowing that that you know this is where this handgun the trigger is prepped in this position i know right there and i know what it's going to take to break and make the shot go off and all that kind of thing um you know if if we did nothing more than just dry fire even if it was just a couple of minutes daily you know by the end of of a quarter of a year you know go through th three months and all of a sudden you've you've invested the time in dry fire the in the investment is immediately applicable when I start looking at my shots on target, mm -hmm. you know, I've spent the time to, to develop that trigger. Um, you know, so, we, we talk about the dry, sorry, Rob, talk no, about the dry fire part, right? Pulling the trigger, pulling the trigger, pulling the trigger. But I think, and maybe Mike feels this way too. It's your presentation. It's the, the, like what you did, the 10,000 reps with your 45, when you got your new 45, it's the hand coming down and, and just getting the right grip on top of that gun from the beginning is going to make all the, it makes everything best. You don't have to recalculate at your presentation. You don't have to fix anything else, but that incorporated with your dry fire, you know, there's, there's like dry fire mags. You can just keep pulling the trigger, which, which are great. And I use them, but, um, to go from the holster or from concealment and, and integrate the whole part as opposed to just shooting at this target, this target, this target, once the gun's already out, I think the more involved you make your practice, you know, the better off you're going to be down the road. Yeah, absolutely. But uh... one of the shifts that I try to get people to make is from aiming with their sights to aiming with the presentation and simply verifying with sight alignment, verifying with what you see. It's it's not saying don't use the sights. It's saying the, the heavy lifting of aiming should be done by the time your eyes shift focus to the front sight. Yeah. Or when, by when the time I, you see the dot. One of my first courses I ever took, um, Anson Beck with Falcon, um, he taped over our front sights and our back sights, just used masking tape over the whole thing. And you still had to shoot at 25 yards and you don't need the sights for hitting that size of a target at 25 yards. If your presentation and your, everything else is together. So it, it does force you back on the basics. You don't need them. And I think as Rob would say in a gunfight, it's too late to look for them. <laughs> the gun needs to already be in action before, before you have a perfect uh, rear notch and front sight post. It, it's it's just one of those things that's built in like like we're talking about if if i establish the grip at the holster the right way and i do that over and over again and then i and i marry my hands together everything is done properly over and over again that my presentation as i press out it's it's there my my sights my sights should be perfect every time i pull the pull the firearm out if i've done my repetitions properly um and i think i think it, mike it, made a really good point is like your sights are there to verify everything else it's you know brian Eastridge goes on and on and on in his in his debunking things in in firearms training you you can be as aggressive and just slap and yank and beat yep. the crap out of a trigger if I don't move the platform, if I, if I get my gun on target and don't move it as I'm doing those things. So I can do whatever with that trigger finger, as long as I, as long as I hold the gun steady on target, that's just, it's the little things that we do that, that disrupt that, that, that takes it, take us off. Um, so yeah, to, that's one of the, Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No. So, so to, to shortcut that and, and get that that practice with your eyes and and neurologically get dialed in um just hastens that that growth in that regard i think yeah it one of the things that i have people do when i'm teaching grip is induce hold it lightly 
and induce a problem. So instead of pushing the trigger straight to the rear, push it diagonal off to the side and then figure out, okay, what grip do I need in order to be able to apply that same bad pressure with my trigger finger and not move the sights yeah. and then do the same with pulling the trigger and then um, figure it out with a bad grip. How do I need to, how do I need to hold it so that no matter what I do, the sights aren't going to move. It, it, it's really, it's really simple. It's just not really easy. Yeah. <laughs> it's really simple. It's just not really easy. Well said, well said. Um, well, the other part on that, like the practice that you were talking about before about the two trails, right? Um, we practice what we're good at. Like yeah. you go to the gym. Okay. Yeah. I like bench press. So guess what? That guy always does bench press or he likes, you know, you don't do back, you don't do legs. It's just, you, you do what you like and what you're good at. And we fall into the same things with our other training. If we're doing it on our own or, or to try and stay motivated. Like what I'm dealing with right now, trying to stay motivated for working out. It's like, sometimes I just don't want to. Um, but I think the dry fire cards gives you like a workout. It says, this is what we're doing today. And it's simple enough. You pick up the card. It says, you know, um, draw fire three, fake reload to fake a jam cycle three, you know, shoot over here, whatever, do two back flips, a cartwheel and uh, 10 sit-ups and then reholster whatever it is, you know, it's, uh, it's Mike's deal. But I mean, I think that that adds, it's a training aid, right? Everybody can pull the trigger, but it, it, gives you something to focus on and it's not the same thing every time. So you're just doing the same thing. So I think that's a great idea, Mike. So there's a, there's a concept in weightlifting and fit, fitness um, called newbie games mm -hmm. where uh, basically you get somebody who's never done bench press before and they're going to see explosive increases in what they can lift in the first few weeks. And it's not because they're packing on tons of muscle. It's because their brain is figuring out how to stabilize the joints and how to recruit and use the muscles properly. And so with shooting, we get the same thing. Uh, initially, we get really fast gains and then things plateau off and then it becomes kind of a, a trud. You have to trudge through and, and keep going. So if we can add variety, all of a sudden we're starting from zero at a new skill and it's building off of something else, but we get those new gains. We get those hits of dopamine and it, it makes something that would have been uh, difficult, way, way more fun. And I, I'll go one step further with this. If you are shooting with a perfect stance every single time, there is basically no balance challenge because that's one of the purposes of a perfect stance is it, it takes care of balance for you. Well, if you can induce a balance challenge with drills that you do early on in a, in a dry fire session or live fire session, one of the things that happens when the brain faces a balance challenge is that the, it causes the brain to release dopamine, endorphins, uh, adrenaline, and noradrenaline, or epinephrine and norepinephrine. And what that does is that's a, that's a nootropic cocktail for accelerated learning. And the reason that it does it is falling is the number two cause of, of accidental death in the world. And the brain knows that. And so it will go to great lengths to learn how to not fall in different situations. And we can hack into that. We get that cocktail of nootropics flowing in our brain. And then we do our dry fire drills. All of a sudden, we're able to learn way, way quicker. We're able to code uh, more skill into long-term memory than if we're just grinding out reps with a perfect stance and no balance challenge. And that cocktail he's talking about is remarkably similar to what you would do what you would get um chemically by cocaine it's very similar yep. 
It's we, why we, we've been told. <laughs> it's why once we get into things like that, that it, that it it People makes can't get out. learnable traits for us. It it it's something that that I'm getting that reward, uh, but I'm not going to keep getting that same reward uh, as I get better and better at it. Um, so you have to find other new ways to to challenge and test yourself and and stretch those. Uh, and, and, and increase your learning in a, in a new way. Um, it's always finding the way to, to, to pressure test something to, to get better and, and, but it, it's also the quickest way to make, make rapid gains as well. So <clears throat> Mike, what, what, uh, what do you have coming up? Are you, is there, is there anything you would like to to get out there? Any anything more than just your website and your book? Uh, those are the main things right now. I've got a, a new target system that uh, very limited release right now. But what it is is it's a, a light based system. So targets light up and you shoot them based on what color they are and they when they get hit then they then they go out and there's a, a few things that are really cool about it number one is that the majority of training that's done is done with an audible stimulus and in a self-defense situation we're going to be making judgments based on what we see yeah and so what this does is it allows us to start off with, with you shoot the light when you see the light turn on and then progress to a red light green light type scenario where ideally you do absolutely nothing and have no visible movement when the no threat light turns on and you quickly and without delay respond to the threat and then we move to a uh, no threat a uh, potential threat that doesn't need to be shot yet. So that would be draw to low ready, which is statistically what happens in about 80% of uh, self-defense uh, situations where the, the gun owner uses the firearm to stop the threat without shooting. Yeah, the display is enough. Yes. And without crossing the lines of brandishing, right, Rob? Yeah. <laughs> which would be the green light. You don't want to draw on the green light uh, or the, the non-threat light. And so what that does then is it gives us the, op the ability to have a target go from being a potential threat to a threat to a non-threat and reanimate back to a threat, depending on whatever happens randomly with the lights and multiple targets. And uh, it's a, a really really neat setup well and that's it, it's such a perfect setup i mean it really is because uh, you know gary my, is my partner at work he he's our critical response team manager and he talks about uh that threat that threat window and the window can open and it can stay open or that window can open and close um mm -hmm. and and that shooting is only good when that window is open. Um, and if, if that threat diminishes and it's no longer a, a lethal threat to us or others, then it's not a shoot situation anymore. So that's a great, great setup. Um, when are you, and obviously you're, you're limited right now. When are you looking at, at releasing something like that? I think it's a great training tool. Yeah, I'm, I'm selling them one-offs right now, uh, but there's a, there's a significant amount of manual labor that goes into making them. And so right. I've got to get, get to the next phase before I can put them into production. Um, big. Yeah. Okay. Good, good, good. Um, well, I'd like to thank you again for, for coming on and helping us out today. Um, well, thank was, you, Rob. Thanks, Phil. It was, it was you, very, very short notice for you. So I, I appreciate you being able to, to uh, adjust with us um, again. Mike's got this book out there, um, Real, War, Real World uh, 
gunfight training. I would strongly encourage taking a look into that. Um, it covers a lot of the stuff that he's talked about today. Um, he's also got realworldgunfighttraining.com and dryfiretrainingcards.com. So check him out. Um, always, always be looking to, to uh, expand your kind of your vocabulary uh, as it is for your training stuff. Um, and, and keep tuning in. We appreciate everybody. You got any takeaways for us, Phil? Well, yeah, I think I'm going to contact him so he can fix my brain so I can keep kind of get some stuff squared away there. That's my number one takeaway is I'm going to give him a call. And, dry, and, and as I mentioned before, those dry fire cards, I think are a great idea just to keep things fresh, keep things going. You know, you can put them into two different groups with your buddy and give all the hard ones to him. Yep. I mean, I think that's, you know, <laughs> plan ahead. Yeah. Right? I hate planning to win. Well, sure. <laughs> well, you know, one of the things that, uh, you know, we didn't plan this, but it worked out this way is a lot of departments and training programs really appreciated them because if there was a drill that conflicted with what they were teaching, that card just disappeared and there was no drama. It wasn't the whole book had to be thrown out. It was, hey, you know what? We've still got 49, 50, 51 cards, 51 drills that are applicable. Right. And Very so, good. Well, we'd like to thank everybody for tuning in today. Um, look forward to seeing you guys again next week. If you got any questions, comments, concerns, you guys can always reach me directly at Rob, R-O-B, at ccwsafe.com. Um, again, we appreciate everybody, and we look forward to seeing everybody again next week. Thank you, guys. God Mike, bless. Thanks for helping us, buddy. Appreciate it.